Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome to the Theater Podcast, intimate personal conversations with theater's biggest names. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and this episode is with Colin Donnell, who plays hunky TV doctor on Chicago Mid and Chicago PD, and he's in Arrow, and he was the despicable Scotty Lockhart in The Affair, and this dude just has a TV resume out the wazoo, and he also has many Broadway credits as well. The guy can sing. Now has a new band called The 1920, which is born out of, as he says, COVID necessity. He and a friend just have this need to create to make music, to express themselves. And with Broadway shut down, with TV, a lot of TV and film shut down, that this was just the time. And the music is so good, you guys. Just please pause it right now. Go over to Spotify or YouTube Music or Apple Music or whatever, wherever you listen to music and pull up The 1920. The new album is called Chaos and Cocktails, streaming on all platforms. Just so good. Before we get into the episode, as always... Find me online at theater underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Leave a rating, leave a review wherever you are listening. It helps everything, everywhere. Find me on Facebook at slash official theater podcast and find me online at thetheaterpodcast.com. Now, everybody, please enjoy this episode with Colin Donnell. Today's guest is a star of stage and screen with Broadway credits that include Jersey Boys, Violet and Anything Goes, and TV credits that include Person of Interest, the despicable Scotty Lockhart on The Affair, Chicago PD, Chicago Med, and now Arrow. In addition, this dude is also an incredible musician. He has a brand new band, born in quarantine, called The 1920. Their album, Chaos and Cocktails is available on all music streaming platforms. Colin Dono, welcome to the Theater Podcast. Thanks for having me, man. No problem. Is it called Chaos and Cocktails or Chaos Plus Cocktails? Chaos and Cocktails. We uh, we, we figured the plus kind of looked cooler on the graphics. Yeah. We went for that. But yeah, it's uh, the the title of the, of the album is Chaos and Cocktails. So you are... Very well known from the TV world, from uh, the Chicago PDs, the Chicago Meds, and and whatnot. And and I personally despised you on the affair. Um, (laughs) So, yeah. So you did your job very, very well. Um, But what people don't maybe don't know from that side of you is your Broadway life and your your performing life, your singing life. And you met uh, you met your wife Patty Murin, of course, doing a show. But tell me about why. Why the 1920 and why now out of, you know, in quarantine? Yeah, so I, so the whole thing was born out of a sort of conversation and passing that Brian Yusufer, my bandmate, and I had backstage at Frozen. Um, I was hanging out in Patty's dressing room. Uh, and for the probably half a person out there who doesn't know that Patty played Princess Anna in Frozen, uh, I was hanging out in her dressing room and Brian was the music director there. And he was taking notes on the show that night and he just popped in and said, Hey, we've been friends for years now. And he somehow the conversation turned on to like, uh, you know, writing music. And I had just gotten done doing almost famous out at the old globe. Uh, and I had told him that, you know, it had really sort of reinvigorated my love for playing guitar and, and, and tooling around, trying to write tunes um and you know brian has a massive background that's what he originally moved to new york city to do to be a to be a producer and a pop songwriter and and uh we you know kind of planted the seeds right there it was he was like maybe we should do this someday and i was like yeah cool when we all get some time because we're busy as all get out and then pandemic um and Somewhere along the line early on in all of us being in our homes, um, I posted uh, an original tune online, which I had never done before and was all scared and, you know, the requisite, you know, self-doubt and all that stuff. 
And Brian saw it and immediately said, hey, man, why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we write some songs together? And really, that's how the entire thing came to be. It was a, a random conversation leading to a random post on social media, leading to a random text. And then we found ourselves really just loving it. We like we get on. We you know I I, I just said we're, we've been friends for years, but it was this whole other dynamic of creative friendship and creative partnership that we really just I think we just didn't realize how much we needed it. Um, and to be working on stuff that was our very own and not, you know, he and I are so used to doing other people's projects and that's awesome. I mean, that's what I love to do, obviously. But, you know, to be doing something for ourselves with no expectations other than to do something that we are proud of in the end was very freeing and really... Uh, not to like blow it out of proportion, but it was just, it, it was exactly what we both needed, I think, at the time. And still is. Well, it, it's, it's interesting to me how you said at the beginning, you know, you posted something online with the requisite self-doubt that comes along with that. And then now you're posting something with, uh, with the 1920 that you want to do that just makes you, make yourselves proud. Do you still have that same like feeling uh, of, Need need for acceptance, need for like, <laughs> of course. When you're posting, uh, I guess it's different when you have something you're putting out with somebody because you can at least share the failure if that's what it becomes. <laughs> <laughs> you also share the the massive success. Yeah, you know, I look, I I I think there is always a bit of creeping self doubt that comes with putting anything out there. Period. And there is look. I'm a performer. I'm an actor. I want to be liked. I want people to like what I'm doing, of course. Um, but there was, I think what's been special about this product or project with Brian <laughs> product <laughs> uh, is that we really were interested. We were, we were just making music, the kind of music that we wanted to make. Um, and whether or not, you know, I sure, I sure as fuck hope people like what we're doing. But in the end, it's, you know, we're very proud of what we did. And it was really, really awesome to put that out there and just have it out there. I mean, that at the bare minimum, that was that. We, we, we made something in all of this. And we were able to create a seven-song album that we really liked and we hoped other people would too. There's there's something I'm looking forward to in, through all this pandemic bullshit and what was 2020 and is now still 2021 and whatnot. But yeah. <laughs> you know, after after the what was it, the pandemic of the late night teens, 19 teens, right? You had the roaring twenties. Mm -hmm. And so there's stuff like that after the plague, there was the Renaissance and whatnot. And you can look back through history and now we're at a point where we've been sequestered and our livelihoods for the most part artistically have been shut down and paused. And I think every, the writers, the creators, the makers and the shakers, right. Have all yep. pivoted because this is something that, uh, you know, your your case in point here. This is something that you have to do to feel whole, to feel like a complete person. You have to write and sing and express yourself in this way, right? And I think we are just now at the beginning of seeing some of this great, great stuff that people are now starting to put out in the world. Yeah, this extra but, time that they find, found themselves with. Yeah, and like there's there's this weird dichotomy, right, where you want to sort of forgive yourself for not being creative or not feeling like you need to be productive. And I look, there were many, many times throughout writing the album and after and before, during, whatever, that I would look at my guitar in disgust or I would <laughs> look at my journal of lyrics and be like, you are a fraud, that's a whole nother story, but, <laughs> but it's like, you know, you, you want to, and you feel compelled to, but you also have to forgive yourself at the same time when it's just not coming. You know, I, I've had this conversation a lot with people and I think you, you hit the nail on the head. What is going to come out of this, whether it's 
next year, five years, 10 years down the line is going to be just an explosion of creativity. Um, because people have been, you know, consciously or unconsciously sort of filling up their cups with this pent up creativity. And, uh, I think, you know, there have been plenty of people who have been productive while it's going on and it's awesome for them. You know, I was for, for a little while, very productive. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I, I I I just think you're right. Like, what's to come is going to be really special, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, now you specifically, I think it's actually really good timing because you've put out the seven song album. You're able to to start to promote it and raise awareness for it without going anywhere, which is great for you. Also, personally, because you've got a newborn, right? That came. It came during quarantine, so you can stay home with with the baby. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a big part of actually finishing the album. Brian was like, Brian. So Brian's got a kid of his own uh, who's a little bit older, and he was like, you know, our, our daughter was born on July fourteenth, and he said, "Look, I think we should give ourselves a deadline to have all the writing done." By July 1st, because you're not going to have any brain space for anything else, but maybe to listen and give some notes on mixes, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, yeah, no, I'll be fine. Now he was right. Oh, that, is a, that is a good partner. That is yeah. the best advice. <laughs> best advice. I, I love that. Uh, why, why I was saying that was um, that when restrictions lift and we're able to get in person again, um, you're already going to have a built-in following, so you'll be able to start performing without starting from scratch, essentially, because you can start from scratch without having to travel and play to half-empty houses or whatnot, because there are no houses right now. Yeah, no, I think like one of the things that both Brian and I are looking forward to, and it's weird because it was only the two of us creating all this stuff, right? We, uh, we essentially did all the instrumentation. We did all the music, just the two of us in this little tiny bubble. And what is really cool to think about is expanding that into a full band and going into a bar and, and playing some clubs and just getting in front of an audience and seeing people in a venue again, experiencing live music all anew and all, you know, just joyously experiencing it together. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, even Broadway specifically, like, I cannot wait for that first downbeat of that first show oh. when, when it all comes back and just going on this journey with this room full of strangers again. There, there's something so cathartic about all of this. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And... I want to. I'm going to ask you about all the all the TV stuff because I'm sure everybody wants you wants to know about that. We'll get into that <laughs> later. But I want to know from the beginning. You've got such an eclectic career now, but I want to know where it all started. So take me back, baby Colin. Where where did you grow up? What was your your childhood like? Yeah, uh, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, super supportive family. I've got two older brothers who are. Uh, who are creative in their own rights. One brother is a photographer. The other is in business. He calls himself the black sheep, but he's also in a creative business. So he, he owns his own company. Um, and my parents were just super supportive. They long story short, and I'll keep it brief because it, it's sort of boring, but I basically lived like the high school musical in reality, <laughs> like that storyline. I was a, I was a sports kid all my life. I broke my ankle playing football my freshman year of high school, and my high school was doing Barnum, the musical, and sort of on a whim, I auditioned for it because I could juggle, and then the music teacher, who uh, her name was Karen Flasher, she was an amazing woman, um, who has unfortunately passed away since then, she literally said, can you sing? And I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, all right, well, um, uh, what about happy birthday? Why don't you sing happy birthday for me? So I sang happy birthday for her. And literally the rest is history. I like, I started singing, singing in choir and I loved it. And as things progressed, I just fell more and more. I got 
bit by the bug pretty hard pretty quickly well what what was it about the the bug I, and it, you know you hear people talk about this a lot you're like oh i got in front of a stage and i got on stage and i had the bug or i felt the acting bug but everybody's i think if you really think about it your personal interpretation of what the bug is is different right so for me i need to be needed so i like to stand on stage and know that I'm responsible for helping tell this story. And of course, the validation from the applause and whatnot, right? Like that's that's what the bug is for me. It's a, ni- a nice way of saying I'm needy. <laughs> more, <laughs> more or less. Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, no, I th- you know, I think f- it's shifted o- for me over the years. Um, there is something there is an, something that inherently felt good about being good at something. And I think before I got on stage, I was just fine. Like I was, oh, I did fine in school. I was okay at sports. It wasn't great by any means. It's not like it was going to take me anywhere. But as soon as I got into rehearsals and into, you know, whether it was choir or on stage for a show, there was, there was something that it just felt like I was good at it. Like I could, uh, like I could see myself continuing to do this because I had some sort of inherent ability to figure it out. And then it became like the puzzle to figure out, like, how do I get better at this? And how do I, how do I turn this into a career? And then as as I got into college, it was continuing to grow that, um, whatever that innate ability was and work on it and figure that out, figure out what the next step was. And I'm always, I think that's been the fun looking back on my career. It's always been about how do I get better? How do I get that next thing? Um, how do I tell the new story in an, in a, in an exciting way that's still going to excite an audience and make them forget that I ever did this stuff beforehand. And so that's what keeps it interesting and fun. What age were you when you, when you broke your, you said you broke your foot? Broke my ankle. Yeah, I was, uh, I guess I was, how old are you as a freshman? 14, 15, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. 14, 14 ish, I guess. So, uh, so as freshman then I was, I was gonna I was wondering because if if it was closer to you know junior senior year, that's the point when you're already supposed to know what you're gonna do for the rest of your life <laughs> right I've heard that yeah. <laughs> so i i i was I was wondering if you already had a plan that then breaking your foot and learning learning that you could sing, discovering that you could sing uh you know what changed that what what path were you originally on? do you remember? You know, I, I, I don't know that I ever had a path. I do remember very specifically when I decided to go to college for theater that I gave myself the, um, the permission to quit if I wanted to basically. And I've, and I've said this a lot throughout my career. As soon as I am not enjoying myself doing this anymore, I should probably get out. And there's something I think pretty freeing about that because it leaves me the opportunity to go in and just have a blast no matter what I'm doing. And it's not to say that I don't, you know, everybody works hard at it and it's a job. It definitely is. But like, it's also really hard. So especially early on, I said, you know, if there, if this isn't bringing you joy, if this isn't like, if this isn't fulfilling you in the way that it once was, you should probably do something else because it's not worth it to keep going down this path. Um, and honestly, now I'm probably at the point where (laughs) what the hell else would I do? Well, so you, you started out, I guess there's a question then, did you start out pursuing straight theater, musical theater, or like TV or film acting? Because that's somewhat different schooling. I mean, they're, they're all related, but very different schooling trajectories. Yeah, so my, my background was all in musical theater at first. Uh, and that was, that was all I was interested in or interested in doing. You know, I did some straight plays in college. Uh, I did, I think I've, 
think I've really only done one straight play as a professional actor. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it's, it was just sort of a, a natural progression to start doing other things as it came along. You know, I was always fascinated by TV and, and film and didn't know when the opportunity would co come along. And when things started to come along, it was like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. I'll do it. <laughs> it's basically, yeah, saying yes when the opportunities present themselves. And I think it's half, you know, uh, unconsciously sort of steering yourself towards the people and the opportunities and uh, this sounds hokey to say but like the 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 energy of the similar of similar people to yourself right the people who want to either um feel like there's a straight play type of people and there's musical theater type of people and there's somewhat tv film type of people and we're all we're all related and we're all needy and <laughs> of course i'll need that validation um but it's i think it is a, a, a different kind of um, of persona, and I applaud you because so many people, or so few people, actually, I think, are able to 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 context switch between the three of them. And then, you know, maybe the straight play people, like being able to sing, is amazing. Being able to dance on top of that is even amazinger. And so maybe that's like, I don't know, the straight play people. Do they keep to themselves because? I don't know where well, I don't know where we're trying to go with this, but I feel like it's sort of like the jets and the sharks and then the third. <laughs> you know, I think there's, there's always been like a little bit of, there's a, there's a little bit of fascination in one world of the other, right? You know, TV and film people look at musical theater people and they're like, how do you do that? But at, you know, baseline, we're all storytellers. We just have a different medium in which we do it. Um, and I think there's what I, what I love in this, you know, in the last 15, 20 years or so is that you see so many people crossing over into different genres of, of theater and, and film and TV that nobody's just one thing anymore. And it really is, um, you know, a quick story. I, I did my, f I did my first and I think only professional straight play it was an edward albee play uh world premiere called me myself and i down at the mccarter theater in princeton and i was 26 27 years old and i was like this is it i'm gonna be a straight play actor from now on this <laughs> is my this is the thing that is making me a straight play actor and then i did high school musical at uh the muni in st louis that summer <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> it was, you know, and and I, it was a huge. It, it, in all seriousness, it was a wonderful lesson in the just the wildness and and the craziness and the, sort of the humility of like, you know what? Yeah, I did that, and it was really cool and prestigious and wonderful. And I can do this other thing, and. I like that just as much. I had just as much fun being in a room with all those fancy people down at the McCarter that I did in St. Louis at my hometown theater in front of 10,000 people. Like it's, it's, they're not really apples and oranges. They're just, they're two different ways of telling the same story. Well, I think you said, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I think um, you said it's the last 20 years that people started to cross over and that can be traced back to Rent, which Bernie Telsey cast. And that and when Telsey and Co. started spinning up in like 98, 99, it, Rent was his first gig. Um, that changed not only the face of theater, but that also put New York on the map for TV and film because it yeah. was all LA at that point. Yeah. So then, you know, fast forward a couple of years and you've got now Bernie Telsey casting his favorite Broadway people in all of this stuff, which actually I would love to know how you got, how you found your foray into, into TV. Was it sort of similar trajectory or, or do you have different, different casting agents, different agents at all? I, I mean, it's, it's, I've been really lucky to have been cast by a variety of different agents who, you know, uh, casting agents who have just been, remarkably supportive but it's I, I think you're right the fact that n 
technology has allowed us actors in New York to be just as available for things that are shooting elsewhere around the country is spectacular. My first, um, my first TV gig was in, was shooting in New York. It was Pan Am on ABC with Christina Ricci and Margot Robbie and, and Margot Robbie. Uh, and, um, and that was my first experience on television ever. And I was doing anything goes at the time and it was great and I loved it. And I, you know, I went into a casting session in person because they were obviously shooting it in New York. Then Arrow happened and I went on tape in New York City and I never had to travel out to LA for a test. They cast it off the tape. It sounds like bragging, but it's not. They were looking for a while and it was like a whole <laughs> thing, but it was like, you know, that's, that's what, that's what is the norm now. People are putting themselves on tape at home. I mean, you know, God willing, they are. And it's, uh, and, and casting directors and directors and producers, they're, they're doing it off of tape and it's opened the door up to every coast in Chicago and everywhere in between because things are just, they're digital. And especially right now with all the, with all the, uh, you know, things happening in the world. <laughs> whatever they may be, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. I miss going into those casting offices, but you know, you alluded to the fact that I've got a kid now. It's a little easier for me to be at home and set up a tripod after she goes to sleep. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I was telling somebody the other day that I actually miss the, the smelly crowded hustle of the subway right now i mean it's yeah. it's you know grass is always greener right but i'm i just miss having somewhere to go <laughs> <laughs> i miss having somewhere oh, to go i, I miss, feel that i miss like shaking someone's hand and giving a hug i was like hey it's good to see you good to see you because a i'm not seeing anybody but b you know that's just like oxytocin release whatever it is for for bonding chemical hugging physical touch yeah there's a lot to miss right now we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. I really admire you and Patty because along, I mean, both of you has just sort of like risen up to this, this level of stardom that most people don't even get to think about. And you still manage to stay very grounded towards each other. And of course your family's like, from what I can tell, right? Your family comes first. You guys are spending, you put, you put each other first and you're still very, very private with your, with your lives. And I was thinking about this the other day, cause I, I had, I was fortunate enough to do a brief interview with, um, with Matthew McConaughey. This is my turn to say, it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not. Um, and he started out the interview by by saying, or by, you know, body language was sort of like laid back and like, all right, this is another promotional thing. I'm just going to get through it. And then by the end of it, it was very much like, oh, it's over. We have to go. And, and, and I was talking to a friend about this and it was very much, um, he was like, you know why you do, you know why Matthew was like this was because you didn't need anything from him. You weren't asking about gossip you weren't asking him to sign something you were just having a straight conversation and that's the blessing and the curse of uh well there's there is blessing and a curse of being of rising up because in your career right you want to achieve you want to ascend uh, but the more you ascend the more you have to pull back which is this weird dichotomy because you're doing it in the first place because you need to express, but you have to express less the more famous you get. <laughs> yeah, I, I like. I mean, somebody like that is on a whole other level than I honestly maybe I ever hope to be. <laughs> That's, uh, but it's. I I think I'm I'm inherently sort of a a private person as it is you know, not that i uh mine i i love talking i'll talk to a fucking brick wall really uh <laughs> but one of the things about being with patty is that she is very um she's just so open about what she who she is what she goes through uh 
you know, whether it's happy times or struggling times, she's in, she's a pretty open book and it's taught me to be a little bit more that way in my personal life. And it's, um, you know, we don't shy away from, we certainly don't shy away from, uh, expressing our feelings, uh, uh, you know, in the hopes that whatever audience we do have that looks at our social media feeds or whatever, you know, maybe finds something a little bit relatable in it. And especially Patty. And, uh, you know, she is sort of the, the major leader on this front in our, in our home. She's, um, and it's something that's so admirable and something that I respect about her so much is that she is, she, she connects to people on a whole nother level because she shares some of the uglier parts of herself and they're not, and I, obviously I don't mean ugly in like, ugh kind of way, but like, you know, she's been through some struggles. She struggles with things on a day-to-day basis that, uh, a lot of people also struggle with, uh, but are maybe afraid to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And she realizes and recognized pretty early on that now that gaining a platform meant that she could maybe have a positive impact in somebody's life. And she's used it so effectively and so well, um, that it is, it's just, you know, it makes you look at her in a whole new light. Um, you know, five years on in our relationship when, when all this stuff started to sort of, when she really started to come into her own with all that stuff. And, um, it was really neat to be a part of. What about you, though? I feel, forgive me for saying this, but I feel like that was sort of a deflection. <laughs> did, uh, did, did you, you and your family, are they communicators like that? Are they, I mean, are, does it make you uncomfortable to, to talk about this? No, no, not at all. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I think, um, it's, it's funny because I think when Patty and I have like an argument or something, I'm always the one who's like, we're going to talk about this until we figure it out. <laughs> uh, and then then I'll be the first one to shut up in public. Uh, but it's, you know, I have, I've tried to be, um, I, I try to be open about, you know, whatever is going on in my life. Um, I you know, I have this sort of love hate relationship with, with social media. Like I enjoy it in some regards and I really don't enjoy it in others. Um, uh, but I, I really, I enjoy having a platform to, to talk with people. Um, and it's not necessarily that I interact a whole lot, but I do, uh, you know, it's, it's like I post something and we post it. So for example, we posted about uh, our daughter's surgery. Um, she, for for those that are listening that aren't familiar with the story, uh, our daughter was diagnosed with a hole in her heart before she was born, and she had to have surgery when she was ten weeks old. Um, open heart surgery on a ten week old—that's mm-hmm. pretty real, um, and it was scary and. Uh, it was uh, all encompassing for a long time. And so when we decided that it was the right time to share it, Patty and I agreed upon that. And like we decided, you know, when the time was right. And going through and reading all the, all the comments on the Instagram post, and I read them all, um, it, was, it was amazing. It was, it, was, it was heartening, especially in kind of dark times to see people being so positive and so warm and so like so giving of their energy no matter what their their own struggles are in their lives at that moment they took the time to say something very nice or to you know be thinking about us and to put it down on their phones and shoot off a comment towards us and so even if I don't get back to all the people all the time, <laughs> <laughs> you read them, I read them. And that's like, I, you know, that, I guess that's my way. And, you know, the other way that I've sort of shared my own stuff is through our music. Like, uh, I, I think, um, you know, going, going through all this and, and writing the album with Brian and, and, uh, cause it was just a way to get things off my chest that 
I was very grateful for the outlet to do it. Um, and it was, you know, dealing with, whether it was dealing with isolation or dealing with, you know, unhappy thoughts surrounding my own relationships with substances or whatever was going on. It was, it was a way to just sort of recognize that that shit was going on in my head and to take it from there to there, that, that there being a pad and pencil and just get it out. Um, and share it with somebody in hopes that maybe they recognize something in it and, you know, can, can relate to a little bit of the turmoil that's going on. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot, there's a lot that people are afraid to say and afraid to talk about that happens very commonly in, in a lot of people's lives. Exactly what you're talking about. Um, when, when we got pregnant, my wife and I, uh, the first time, and then all of a sudden, even though we fortunately like, consider myself extremely, extremely fortunate to have two easy pregnancies with two healthy boys, um, I didn't realize how lucky and how fortunate that was until after we got pregnant. And then everyone is who was afraid to talk about it publicly before was coming out saying, I can't get pregnant. I was having, I had a miscarriage. I had two miscarriages. I, IVF isn't working. And there's, there's all of this inherent shame that I don't quite understand. Uh, shame about failing? Is that what it is? Is it shame? Like, and then and then the coping side of it too, you mentioned substances. I don't, like people have all their different ways of coping with it, some healthier than others. I just don't understand, I don't understand why, as someone who has also been an open book, why people don't want to talk about this sort of thing. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just, I think, I don't have the answer, certainly. I mean, I just don't. But I do think that there's so many things that go on in your brain when you're going through situations like that. And, uh, you know, Patty's also been open about this. We had, we had a miscarriage before we had Cecily. Patty had a miscarriage before we had mm -hmm. Cecily. And going through that, like, you're right. It's amazing how many people you start to realize have gone through the same experience that you are going through at that moment. And you wonder why it's the first time you're hearing about it. Uh, and I really think it comes down to a societal uh, sort of block where we're afraid to talk about the ugly shit. And it's hard. It's hard to talk about how you know, devastating that was to the both of us, to me. I, you know, Patty certainly had her own experience with it and I had my own experience. There was, there was a, a, a different sense of loss, but still a sense of loss that came along with that. Mm. And then, you know, going through the things that we went through with Cecily when she was born, it's you know, again, we heard from all these people once we were out about it or, you know, even before we were public about it, we, we had a lot of people that we were able to rely on who were amazing, you know, friends, family who had, you know, either gone through a similar experience themselves or had friends that were close to them that had gone through similar experiences. But it's still fucking scary. <laughs> and you know, I think the both of us consider ourselves very, very lucky that we were able to have each other to talk to. Uh, and we both found people outside of ourselves that we could go and confide in. Uh, and, you know, there were a lot of times that I just wanted to fucking scream about it and or cry about it. And, you know, there was... I'm glad to be able to talk about those things now. Um, and I think it's m the most important thing is that there is somebody out there that you can talk to, <laughs> you know, whether it is, a f whether you're deciding to do it publicly and airing your, your, you know, not, I, I don't say that in a, in a bad way, whether you, whether you're deciding to be out in the world with it, or whether you go talk to a therapist about it, or whether you talk to a family member or a friend or a best friend or, you know, whomever. Fuck it, a stranger. Just talk to somebody about it. You know, these things are, 
they're just less common, less uncommon. Does that make sense? They're more, more common. common. More common. <laughs> they're, they're, they're more common than, than we hear about in the outside world. And so it, it's, um, you know, it all comes down to knowing that you're not alone. Period. End of story, I think. I totally agree with all of that. And I, I wish that people would, would, I guess, present more of their authentic self. But part of that, too, as, as I sort of dig into this thought, is that maybe they're not even aware of what their authentic self is. You've been fortunate enough to have a, 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 a support base, your wife and your family and your friends, who are open and able to talk about things. And you express yourself through your music and through your art and acting in other ways. And that's that's catharsis. It's it's part of why people continue acting in this stupid, horrible business. Is it's a form of therapy and a form of catharsis. Um, but then a lot of people want to get that. Maybe ooh ooh. I just have a, had an epiphany. I was what I was going to say was that I wish people on social media, which can be a tool for good and bad would post more about their authentic selves. And then I was going to go down and saying, people don't know what their authentic self is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then going back to what we talked about at the beginning of what is the acting bug? What is, what is the bug, right? That need for validation or that need for self-discovery. Maybe now social media is giving people the bug in whatever chemical dependency, whatever chemical need that is. Uh, and, and they're getting that validation through likes. So that's what all that they post, positive things. Yeah. I mean, look, it's a, a I, I think I just said, like, I, I do have a love-hate relationship with it. I enjoy it on one hand and, and, and really am, I, it is inherently a curated view of who you are, right? So, what we decide to post, and I'm, I, it's not like I'm guilty of it. It's like sometimes I don't want to post, like, I, I know what gets the likes. Right. And sometimes I don't want to post it. I don't <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I want to, I want to show you a picture of my dog because he looks really cute or like, hey, there's a deer in my, and, and I do this. Like, I, I just, I, it's not like I'm some hero posting, you know, going against the norm. It's just that I think that since social media is an inherently curated platform, people get to decide what side of them they show. And I think there are a lot of people out there who who attempt to show the real show their real selves, and I applaud them. Uh, and then there are people out there who, um, you know, show an idealized version of themselves and that's fine. As long as you are aware of that going into clicking, you know, double tapping on somebody's picture or something like that. Um, so it's, you know, I think you and I are of a generation that grew, like it came into being while we were adults. So we're figuring it out. And we maybe see it for what it is. There's a whole nother generation that grew up with it. And I don't know what their viewpoint, you know, how they see, uh, you know, if they think that all of what they see is real. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I just, <laughs> I know, this is a rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, keep going. I love this. I love it. It's, it's just, you know, I, I, on on one hand, for all the good that it is, I I just hope there's something that helps us figure out how to only use it for good. I mean, this is it's not going to happen, though. No, no, no. it's not. Uh, no, it's it, it won't. But I think if people seek out what is good about it. And, uh, you know, follow. And if they see it for what it is, maybe that helps. I don't know. I don't yeah, yeah. It's all it's subjective because what it is to us, you're right, as a generation that grew up with modems uh, is very different than what my kids and what your daughter is going to think about it. 
because we're, we're live chatting right now over the internet. That's fucking mind blowing. I know. <laughs> I know. It's it's insane the amount of technology that even, you know, you and I now, our generation takes for granted. You know, when when there are grandparents and people at home are who are still programming VCRs. Yeah. I have a I have a whole case of DVDs next to me here that I don't know what to do with because I can get all these <laughs> things on demand now. What do I, I I can't bring myself to get rid of them? What do I do with these DVDs? I mean, they'll come back in like twenty years or so. That'll be the hip thing. I guess vinyl's coming back, yeah. It'll be like Betamax. Oh, oh <laughs> Beta <laughs> Betamax never made a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bet- Betamax. I remember when HD first came out, high def as a as a format. There was the HD brand and Blu-ray. That's right. And porn went with Blu-ray. That's yep. what won. Porn went with VHS. That's why B- that's why Betamax died out. That's right. Little known fact there. Maybe it was a known <laughs> fact. Who knows? But yeah, porn controls consumer media delivery. Formats, yeah, I guess. Maybe. Anyway, yeah. anyway we'll, we'll go. Now it's the internet. You don't need yeah. anything. Uh, <laughs> oh, so earlier you mentioned Arrow, the TV show, and isn't there some connection to wine that that show has brought you? <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, Stephen Amell, who played Arrow on the show, also has a wine company called Knocking Point Wines, um, and they do these amazing collaborations with uh, celebrities to usually benefit uh, charities. They've got they've done some stuff with the Real Housewives. Uh, they just recently did one with uh, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis. Um, and so, uh, Steven and his business partner, Drew Harding, uh, contacted Patty and I before the holidays and said, Hey, how would you like to do a wine with us? Um, and we, we would, we would love for it to benefit the theater community to which of course we were totally down because we both love wine and we both love our community. So, uh, Long story short, it's called the 11 o'clock number. Uh, It is the first time that Patty and I have both been above the title, which is... (laughs) Um, (laughs) is, uh, It's a a red wine. It's the small things. The small things. I know. It's literally, our names are tiny above the title, but it's awesome. Uh, And it's really cool to have your name on a wine bottle. I can understand why people do it. Um... But it's going, the, you know, proceeds from the sale are going to three charities, um, uh, the Actors Fund, Black Theater United, and also in honor of Rebecca Luker, uh, we're also benefiting Project ALS Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, she was such a, she was just a devastating loss and a year of devastating losses. Um, So we wanted to see if we could honor her in in our own way. yeah, and you can go to knockingpointwines.com to check it out. It's available. We just did this really fun uh, game drunken drunken artist game night uh, this past Sunday, uh, where we actually raised all the proceeds from from tickets for that event. Uh, went to those three charities, and we raised over eighteen thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, just people tuning in to watch a huge group of uh, us. Uh, get drunk and play Pictionary. So it was really, <laughs> we were happy to raise a ton of money. And, uh, you know, it's just going to keep going up with, with every bottle that we sell. So everybody who's listening out there, please go out and buy it. It's delicious. How does one make a wine? Like they came to you and they said, We have this idea. We want to put your name above the title. You're like, Great. Personal validation. That's awesome. Now, how do I. Like, what did you go through? You're like, I want something sweet, or I want a red, or I want a white, or how do how do you make a wine? Well, we were on a pretty tight timeline, so basically, we asked, you know, what do you, what kind of grapes do you guys have uh, available for us to make? Uh, one I'm plays a, big, a doctor on TV; the others in <laughs> the others a princess grape, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and we, so you know, they, I, I, I've been a big red wine fan for a long time. Um, I that's m- when I'm drinking wine. That's mostly what I'm drinking. Uh, so they sent us, uh, they have a winemaker of course with the company and he sent us three different blends. Um, and we tasted them, 
twist our arm. It was terrible work, but somebody had to do it. Uh, <laughs> so we tasted the wines, um, and we uh, they said, you know, if you if you if you like one of them, great. If there's anything you want to change about it, you know, just let us know, and uh, and and we can make some changes. We found of those three, we found one that we really really enjoyed, and we thought would be was a, was a little spicy. It was a little. A little different, which we thought was a great representation of the theater community. <laughs> uh, but it's spicy and different. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it's fifty percent Cabernet, fifty uh, percent Malbec, and uh, yeah, it's it's delicious. So really, all the work except for the tasting was somebody else. But we came up <laughs> with a name. Uh, we worked with one of one of the guys over there over at Knocking Point to uh, design the label, and yeah, we we ended up with our own wine. That's very, very Moira Rose of you. I, I think that's very cool. <laughs> Darling, we have a wine. <laughs> I would like to wrap this episode up here with the three standard closing questions that I ask right. everyone on these episodes. The first one, very simply, is what motivates you? Uh, it's not so simple anymore. I mean, well, actually, it's more simple than it used to be. Now it's just family. Now it's and like it's it's uh, it, it's all about our daughter. I mean, and it 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 encom- that encompasses a lot, you know. But it makes me want to be a better person, better husband, a better father, a better performer, a better actor, singer, whatever it is. But it 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 all all roads lead back to making her life the best it can be. What advice would you give your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? It's going to be bumpy, but it's going to be worth it. That's pretty true in in almost all situations. Very good advice. Hardest question, last one. If you can only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what show would you see? Oh shit. Um Oh Man. One show for the rest of my life. That really is a hard question. Mhm. Uh I'm going to go with Oh boy. I'm going to go with Singing in the Rain. Ooh, yes. One of my personal favorites. It's got a little bit of everything. But I, I'm, if I'm only going to be able to see one show for the rest of my life, I don't want a sob story. I want something to keep me, like, entertained and laughing. And it's got a little... It's got the love story. It's got the great dancing, super great tunes. Uh, yeah, I'm going singing in the rain. All right, we'll go with that. Where can we find you on social media? <laughs> at Colin Donnell, or you can find my band at at the 1920. Uh, those are both on Instagram. Um, uh, I am at Colin Donnell on, across all social media. Uh, the band is at the 1920 on Instagram. Uh, we are also at the 191920 <laughs> on Twitter because whenever. I don't really know <laughs> what the limit. rules were. Yeah, character limits probably. Uh, but yeah, uh, find us there. We've got some. You know, we're we're very excited. We're we're working on new tunes all the time. Um, we had the release, and then we had our Christmas release, and uh, now we're just like compiling stuff for whenever we get our stuff together to to put out some new music. We're excited. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So for those listening and not reading the show notes, the nineteen twenty is spelled out. Yeah, you know, all letters except for yes. the Twitter Twitter handle. I want to ask you a question real quick about uh, it's Christmas time again. The yeah. the single that you just released on the picture is a rhino from the Bronx <laughs> Zoo that I see many times taking my kids to the Bronx Zoo. Did you have to get permission from them to use that image? I don't think so. Uh, Brian actually was Brian took his kid to the Bronx Zoo and and took a picture of it, and I was like, that works. 
<laughs> we were trying to figure out what to what to put on our what what to put on the <laughs> on Spotify and everything to be the image for the for the song for the single. And he was like, "What about this as a joke?" And I was like, "That's pretty perfect. I like just it. a just a rhino with a wreath around his neck, <laughs> a, a steel rhino with a wreath. Yep." <laughs> yep, I love it. All right. You can get more of me at the theaterpodcast.com. Find me on social media, theater underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter, on Facebook slash official theater podcast. Leave rating and a review. This has been edited by Matthew Hendershot. Thank you to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and the outro music. And Colin, thank you most of all. I have enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for having me, man. Make the world a little colorful